coming up on this edition of The Climate Show, we are cookless, but we are all about the ozone layer as well. Absolutely. We're going to be talking to Dr. Olaf Morgenstern from the National Institute of Water and Atmospheric Research about the ozone hole, how it happens, and the impact it has on climate. And solutions. We're looking at fuel cells and solar goodness as well. It's all coming up on this edition of The Climate Show. This episode of The Climate Show is brought to you by... Celsius.co.nz Hottopic.co.nz Skepticalscience.com Scoop.co.nz And KiwiFM Welcome along to another climate show. This is episode 12 of the climate show, a show all about climate change, climate uh, science, policy, news and politics. My name is Glenn Williams, broadcasting from the Kiwi FM studio in Ponsonby in Auckland City. And my co-host is Gareth Renaldon. He's down in uh, Waipara in North Canterbury, South Island of New Zealand. Hello, Gareth. Hi, Glenn. How are you doing? Very well. Oh, by the... Mm-hmm. I have to say, Glenn, um, congratulations on joining the band of the bespectacled. I am. I am um, bespectacled. This is a whole new thing. My world um, now seems to be in, in HD, which I never knew. I didn't know that uh, things were that bad. But I can see you. Is it, is it 720p or 1080? <laughs> it feels like 1080 to me, actually. <laughs> Amazing. Um, I, I, I've just been walking around the house just going, oh, oh, look at that. Oh, I can see every blade of grass out the window. Yeah, anyway, I should have done it a long time ago. As long as the grass is outside the window, you'll be okay. (laughs) This is true. This is true. Well, it's um, certainly nice to be back. We did miss a week um, because uh, everything kind of conspired against us, including getting a guest and also John Cook was tied up. Um, In fact, he's still tied up this week. Not literally, of course, but um, he's not available for the show this week. But um, we certainly do have a great show lined up, that's for sure, which I do want to tell you about in a second. Um. But some uh, a few things had come up in the past week about how we go forward with making sure that the climate show sticks around for a wee while, um, and some suggestions also coming through um, about certain things that we should include on the show, like um, transcribing the show, um, getting getting someone to actually uh, get it down in words as well. There seems to be some demand for that, I think. Yeah, we've had a couple of suggestions that it would be useful to have a transcript of the show. Um, the, the, and I, 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 if people would like that, um, it's certainly something that you know um, we can look at doing. The only problem, and it's the big problem, mm. is that transcribing um, an hour to an hour and a half of chat a long time, especially the um, waffle. And, oh, absolutely. Um, and uh, to be honest, I don't think Glenn or I have really got that time to do it. Um, I know over the years as a journalist that if you tape record an interview with someone, um, going through that tape recording and and making sure that you've got the quotes absolutely accurate takes forever. So um, that's that's one thing. Um, If there are any volunteers out there who might be prepared to do transcription work for us, well, um, we'd love to hear from you. Maybe if um, even if it's just um, important sections, like the important news parts and then and the interview and John Cook's section and the solutions, well, that's actually the whole show. But, but whatever's deemed to be the most important in that show, that might be helpful. Yeah, yeah, I, I think that's good. If, if people wanted to go back through and say, um, I don't know, do a transcript of our interview with Kevin Trenberth, for instance, um, and I'm very much hoping um in fact it's in it's in the diary that we'll be interviewing james hansen yeah um during his new zealand tour you know those sorts of things where we're talking to um big names in the business um yeah might be might be a good idea to to transcribe those ahead of other parts of the show yeah uh, another um suggestion has been to mark out in the video um where particular sections are the news and the main interview feature in john cook um now, to be honest, I, I, I've been a little bit slack. I, 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 to... It's all right. I, I did mean to go back to YouTube and have a look at the functions within YouTube because I think I can actually mark out certain sections. I'll, I'll go back and do that and have a look, but um, that might make it easier. Some people are saying, oh, look, an hour and a half. Man, I don't have time to sit around for an hour and a half. And then by, 
we get that sort of feedback, but we also get feedback of people saying uh, that they enjoy spreading it out over a week or doing the dishes or doing the house cleaning while they're um, while they're listening to it. And you can watch occasionally, but you don't necessarily have to be seated in front of your computer staring at it the whole time. You could have it in a tab running while you're doing work or, or whatever. It, I guess it just depends on, on how people um, use it. But there is the audio as well. Yep, I think that's right. And, mm. and th- actually, it's probably harder to scrub through the. Well, no, you can do. You can scrub through both the audio and the video, mm. um, just by dragging the little thing on the YouTube. You can drag it forward. And I guess if we put just simple timings in for when we start the interview or start the John John section and so on, yeah. that would help people just to find their way around. But all this um, has got. I'll, a- I'll try, I'll, in fact, in fact, I'll try and do that for this show. Okay. Well, all all this I is. Can. I mean, I could do it when I'm editing. But anyway, I don't know. Well, we'll see how it goes. But all this has got us thinking about. Um, all this has got us thinking about how uh, to keep the show sustainable going forward. Because one thing we also want to do is provide a separate video download version, which is quite helpful for people with portable devices like iPods or iPhones or Android devices, um, who might want to take the video yeah. on the road. But all this kind of costs and bandwidth, um, and. I know we just want to float the idea if we had a um, a virtual tip jar, which I know is popular on some sites around the net, a virtual tip jar that people might want to donate. I don't know if that's, if that's something that people want to do. So I, I really want to put the question out there to listeners and viewers. Um, if there was a tip jar, you know, would you do, donate a certain amount, whether it be a one-off payment or a monthly or a yearly kind of subscription? Um, if we offered that, would you do it? And And... Um, if you want to give us some feedback on that, you can in the comments section at Hot Topic um, or on the climate show.com or um, on the Facebook page or via Twitter as well, twitter.com forward slash the climate show. What are your thoughts, Gareth? Yeah, I think um, there are lots of things that we'd like to do with the show that cost money. And, um, it, you know, there's the, doing an iPhone app or an Android app, there's actually a service that will enable us to do that, which would wrap the show up as an app you could download to your iPhone or iPad or your Android phone. Yeah. Um, but they, they cost money. Mm. And Glenn and I would just like to feel that if we if we do develop the show in that way, that we've got enough cash flow coming in. So it's really, let's get some feedback from the listeners and viewers about, you know, what they might think was a reasonable amount of money to tip into either a tip jar or one of these sort of collection services that exist. Um, and the other thing, of course, is that if there's anybody out there who would like to sponsor the show, um, clearly we, we might draw the line if Exxon Mobil offered us a huge <laughs> amount of money. <laughs> but, um, you know, that, but, somebody yeah. doing sustainable business, um, any, anything related to um, climate and carbon emission reductions and so on, we'd be delighted to discuss um, some sort of sponsorship deal with you. And that and could be, give, give, yeah, that could be in a New Zealand context, but it also, because this is a global show, it could be anything that appeals to anyone um, around the world as well. Yeah, absolutely. And mm. uh, we'll be, you know, hopefully the um, listenership and viewership of the show will be increasing as we, uh, the longer we go on. And yeah, I think there's, uh, there's opportunities there. We'll, we, we don't want to um, have an ad laden show. Yeah. Um, Cause this is a show about climate science and policy and politics, not, and the solutions. It, it's not about um, Glenn and Gareth making money, although that might be nice in the long run, but um, it, we had, we do have to recognize we need to mm. be sustainable. Sustainable. That's the. That, I thought that <laughs> yeah, word had <absolutely>. died. <laughs> anyway, should we crack on with the news? Yeah, we should. Um, and and we just a, a quick mention that um, our special guest today is all about um, ozone. We're talking to to Dr. Olaf Morgenstern, who's a chemistry climate modeler at NIWA. I thought it would be a very good opportunity now because I think ozone's been out of the news for a long, long time. So it's time to revisit ozone and also some recent research about. Um, the ozone layer and what's up with that. So that is coming up. But let's dive into the news. And always a good opportunity on the show to talk about the weather. I love talking about the weather. And there's been some mad weather around the world, including right here in Auckland, New Zealand. Yes, absolutely. The staggering pictures. I I was um, actually driving around at the time and was able to stop and fire up the iPhone and have a look at um, a YouTube video of this tornado um, hitting the suburb of Albany. Um, now, tornadoes in New Zealand are not unheard of, but they do tend to be small, usually. Um, 
this one was uh, has been graded as a um, an F two. So yeah, um, you know the second um, up from the bottom, as it were. And you can see from the pictures that Glenn's showing, it was sort of twenty to thirty meters wide. Um, I think forty meters wide at its widest. It um, had a track of about eleven kilometers across um, the suburbs of Auckland. Uh, one person was killed and a couple of people seriously injured. So for New Zealand, this was um, really quite a big event. Uh, not unheard of. I have to say that in 1948, three people were killed mm. um, in a in a tornado. So and in 91, um, one person was killed in the same suburb of Albany. As yeah, well. yeah, yeah. Now the weather conditions yesterday were were perfect for generating um, large. Um, uh, thunderstorms basically and associated with large thunderstorms can come tornadoes and of course the, the place in the world where this happens par excellence is in the US where you get uh, warm moist air coming up off the Gulf of Mexico where uh, at the moment sea surface temperatures have been at their um, close to their highest yeah and uh, well, for the time of year anyway and then you get cold air coming down from the north and you also get wind coming over the Rockies, which adds a certain amount of rotation to these storms. So you end up with massive thunderstorms and massive, massive tornadoes. And this last, um, this last month, the uh, amounts of, uh, it's just been absolutely staggering, the, the kind of record breaking um, numbers of tornadoes that have been going around the US. Now, I, to follow um, a lot of weather events, a great place to go is Dr. Jeff Master's Wonder Blog. Yeah. Um, and I'll, I'll put the link in the, in the um, show notes. But um, the April 25th to 28th tornado outbreak in the US is now the deadliest US tornado outbreak of the last 50 years. Wow. Um, 249 people died in Alabama. And Tennessee and Mississippi had 34 deaths each, and there were also deaths in Arkansas, Georgia, Virginia, Louisiana, and even in Ontario in Canada. 28 separate tornadoes kill people. It's just a staggering outbreak. And to give you an idea of this, if you can whop it up on the screen, yeah, the satellite image that uh, Glenn's now got up on screen is t from the uh, NASA's MODIS um, Terra satellite, I think. And it's just, an, no, it's the Aqua satellite. Um, just an astonishing picture that shows the damage trails from these um, tornadoes on Friday, the April the 29th. Um, three of them um, running for, you know, tens of miles across the Alabama countryside near Tuscaloosa and Birmingham. Wow. And I think that's just staggering that those tornadoes were big enough to leave a trail that can be seen from space. Uh, it's just mind-boggling. Amazing. And um, I, I also noticed um, searching for uh, videos of the tornado here in New Zealand and in, um, in Albany that um, uh, there are also uh, tornadoes um, in Albany, Missouri as well. So they both have that in common. There's some, at least some two, 2009 footage that I saw as well. So... People are, yeah. are searching for Albany. Um, they can get a little bit confused between between the two. Yeah, the interesting thing is, I said at the beginning that the um, Albany tornado was F two. Well, the highest um, uh, category of, 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 of violence for tornadoes is F five, hmm. EF five, uh, which means they have winds greater than two hundred miles per hour. Wow. And there were at least 11 EF4 tornadoes and two EF5 tornadoes um, in that 25th to the 28th outbreak. Mm. Uh, it was in one case um, in Smithville in Mississippi, the tornado was only three miles long, but it was half a mile wide. Um, this is an absolutely massive... Monster. Absolute monster. Yeah. 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 Quite incredible. Um, so, I mean, the, the question that quite a few people have been asking, obviously enough, is um, has has this been affected by, by climate change? Is mm. global warming having an impact? And um, just sort of monitoring a conversation among scientists about this, I think the, 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 the bottom line is that uh, we don't know enough mm. about how tornadoes um, uh, are likely to behave in a changing climate to say that um, the, there was any impact from global 
warming and um, sort of tornado outbreaks either in, but, uh, in the US I, but, or, or, or here. Or here. But, 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 and, and, and we go back to what Kevin Trenberg said on the show um, a couple of months ago. Yeah. The fact that the, there is more energy in the system now means that um, climate change is having an impact generally hmm. uh, it, it, you know things are being made worse by climate change so whilst we can't say that you know the fact that there were so many tornadoes in the u.s or a tornado in albany we can't say those were caused by climate change hmm. we can say that because there's more energy in the system uh we're beginning to see more extreme events so yeah it's it's um the, the you know, it's just one more sign that I, I actually saw a wonderful thing on um, the Green Party of New Zealand has a blog called Frog Blog. And they there was a guy there uh, commenting under actually a, a, they, they published the list of places that Jim Hansen's going to visit in New Zealand. Yeah. And, and um, this bloke said that he'd been in a shop in the east coast uh, of New Zealand where they've just had huge floods, 500 mils of rain in two days washing uh, enormous amounts of topsoil out into the ocean and um, th he went into a shop and there was a little old lady in there probably in her 80s and she said well you know it's not surprising it's uh, the world's getting warmer and all the ice is melting huh. you know the kettle the kettle's on yeah and that's what's happening you well, know the uh, kettle's on and it's coming towards the boil and it would be a miracle if we didn't see um, more extreme events and, and uh, but I, anyway, I guess from an unscientific point of view uh, looking at um, these recent tornadoes, you could say, well, it's part of a trend that there has been um, over the past two years. You got the ice storms and um, the extreme um, summer temperatures and drought as well. Um, so this, so this, this has really just followed on. I mean, that that would be the uns unscientific point of view, but you could look at the trend, though. Yeah, I mean, the thing is that it, it as as Kevin Trenberth said on the show, sorting out. Climate change's impact on individual weather events is difficult and complex. Yeah. But what we can say is that, if you like, the ground rules are changing. And the, the, the fact that there is, on average, 4% more water vapour in the atmosphere means that there's more fuel for these extreme weather mm. events. And that's just a new reality that we're going to have to come to terms and, with. And this all quite tidily uh, leads us on to the next story um, over the other side of the planet where the UK has seen a heat wave and the warmest April for more than 100 years. Yes, in fact, um, the longest temperature record in the UK is called the Central England Temperature Series. And that goes back to 1659 and april was actually warmer than it has been in the last 350 years wow um so this was an extremely hot start to the year um it's again um you can't say that this was directly caused by climate change but you can say that we do expect to see more heat waves as the climate warms you mm. know you get warm events but the warm events get warmer as it were because the average is rising so yeah. here we've got a heat wave happening in britain um and, and a lot of people have enjoyed it over the easter holiday it was certainly the warmest easter since they started recording that back in 1960s or something um and but the uk average temperature was 10.7 degrees celsius uh degree warmer than the last warm April record, which was set in 2007. Mm. So these things are happening, you know, pretty regularly now. And I guess if um, if I was living in Britain, um, I would be a little bit concerned about the prospects for summer because um, March was dry um, across much of the UK. It's been followed by a warm, dry April. And one thing we do know is that if you get a run of dry months and hot weather, mm. then you can run into problems with drought. And just like the British are never prepared for snow because it's always the wrong kind of snow or they haven't got enough grit for the roads or whatever, yeah. so, um, they're never prepared for drought as well. So, you know, look, we can, I think, look forward. It'll either, it'll either be a, a barbecue summer, as the Met Office once famously um, predicted, mm. um, with people complaining about not being able to water their lawns or what have you, or, or, or it'll be um, another summer of intense rainfalls. So... Yeah, let's watch the British weather over the next few months. <laughs> Indeed. All right, moving along. Major polluters say 2011 uh, climate deal is not doable. So we may as well pack up the show, pack up, uh, turn off all the machines here and go home.
Yeah, it's um, it's a bit of depressing news. Uh, basically, um, the um, US, uh, the Europeans, and the group of um, 17 countries that call themselves the Major Economies Forum, um, which includes China and so on, they think it's highly unlikely that there's going to be a legally binding deal done in Durban. So as we've discussed earlier on the show, at the end of every year, we get another one of these conferences of the parties. Um, 2011's is going to be in Durban. And after last year's, there was uh, in Cancun, there was hopes that, you know, maybe we could get a, a deal together in time for 2011. But after the kind of mit the, the, the meetings that have, they've had in, in the recent past, um, just in the last few months, months trying to get things moving forward uh, it just doesn't look good mm. and yeah it's it's depressing news okay um moving on again to um the um, antarctic um the ice cores there show that co2 increases start within a couple of hundred years of warming beginning at ice age terminations uh the famous lag that some skeptics claim does prove co2 warming like is much shorter than previously thought yes that's right um and I put this in because the, I, I was hoping we could talk about it with John, and perhaps we will uh, when we get him back on the show in a couple of weeks' time. But one of the classic um, sceptic arguments is that uh, the best dating that we've had from ice cores in Antarctica has suggested that CO2 in the atmosphere didn't begin to rise until some time after the temperature as measured in the ice cores started to rise and the lag was variously um, anywhere between 400 and 1300 years and people have often talked about an 800 or 1000 year lag and skeptics love to use this lag and they they, they argue that well look you know if um, if uh, temperature starts going up before co2 then obviously co2 can't cause temperature to go up now that's not the case of course because the two things um, it's a, the, the, the emission of CO2 at the end of an ice age is actually a feedback to warming that's solar warming that's happening because of orbital changes. Mm. Um, what this uh, new study has done, uh, a couple of people from the Australian Antarctic Division in Hobart, um, they think that the lag of temperature, because they've been working on cores from uh, the Sipel and Bird ice cores in Western Antarctica, they reckon that the lag could be more like 200 years, possibly even less, according to Tas van Omen, who was the um, lead author. This is uh, a new scientist report I'm quoting here. Yeah. Uh, and what that means is it, it, you know, intellectually, I suppose, the idea that there's a thousand year lag before, between temperatures rising and CO2 um, sort of suggests that maybe there's, you know, this is a bit explaining that can is not easy you've got to go into a sort of lengthy explanation about feedbacks and everything else the shorter the time period um the easier i think it is to explain um how things uh, are happening yeah. uh, the ice age thing so it's not necessarily a great leap forward in science i just think it it makes it a little bit easier for us to uh deal with the and i think reasonably valid idea that if there's a thousand year lag well surely something else must be going on um i think this this tends to support the idea that the co2 is a feedback to the other warming and so on so i, I just thought that was an interesting thing and, and perhaps we can talk about it with john next time okay all right well from one um side of the world to the other um to the arctic where the ice melt there is accelerating, which really just follows on from uh, previous shows where we've talked about this, but some new research indicates that it's just so. Yeah, absolutely. What, what this is is a uh, new report by the Arctic Monitoring and Assessment Programme, which is a, a, a grouping of Arctic countries who um, conduct scientific research and, and, and do reports to uh, cover things of interest in terms of arctic science and and the arctic politics too mm. um so what they've been finding is that it's a report over the last covering the last assessment um in 2005 so six years on and what they're finding and what they're reporting is stuff that we've talked about before but perhaps the most interesting thing is that they reckon that um the arctic's contribution to um 
the melting of, of Greenland's ice sheet and, and the other glaciers and ice caps could mean that we'd be, we'd be heading for up to 1.6 metres of sea level rise by the end of the century. In fact, they give a range of about one to one and a half metres of, of sea level rise. Um, so this is kind of underlining the um, vulnerability that we have to uh, warming in the Arctic. But you see, Gareth, basically- as, as an Earth user, um, <laughs> I, think, I think that's what we could call us humans. We're Earth users. Because um, uh, we always get this by the end of the century. How about by in 20 years or by 10 years we'll see this amount of, um, of, of um, sea level rise? Why can't we, why can't we do that? Well, that's because we don't know enough about what's contributing what, and we're only, you know, it's complex. You've got contributions to, well, first of all, the sea level, sea isn't sort of perfectly level all over the planet. There are high spots and low spots, and we can measure them by satellite, and those are affected by um, things like the El Nino Southern Oscillation. So, well, we're in a La Nina phase, sea level go up in one area and go down in another, and so it, it varies considerably around the world. So it's not not trivial. And then you've got lots of different contributions. You've got runoff from land. Um, you've got the um, the expansion of the water as it warms up. Mm. So that physically, um, the whole ocean expands and gets gets higher. Then you've got the runoff from glaciers and ice caps, and then the contributions from the great ice sheets, Greenland uh, and Antarctica. So, but I do you know, I do look forward to the time when scientists can change that time frame, though. Do you, you know what I mean? It'd be able to um, put it within our lifetime, so so that we can really start to understand the context. Yeah, well, I think that's going to happen um, really quite soon. One of the things I want to talk to Jim Hansen about when he's over in New Zealand is that he has recently um, put a draft paper up for discussion in which he talks about how he expects sea level rise to begin to accelerate quite soon. Now, remember, we've already seen an acceleration in sea level rise over the last 100 years. So it's gone from um, 2 millimetres to 3 millimetres per per um, year in terms of the increase in, in, in sea level. So we've seen an acceleration already, but Hansen is um, projecting that, that that will begin to increase. And obviously, if you're going to get to half a metre by 2050 and a, a metre or a metre mm. and a half by um, the year 2100, you are going to have to see an increase beyond that. And Hansen seems to think that um, this is on the cards in the relatively near future. So that's something I want to explore with Jim, and I, I, hopefully we can address it in the next show. Okay. Related to this, um, the Chinese icebreaker is going to reach Iceland over the Arctic. When's this going to happen? Yeah, that's going to happen this year. Um, this is what I call geopolitics ahoy, because <laughs> what's happening is that the Chinese they don't directly have any um, sort of land around the Arctic, but they recognize that it's strategically a very important place to be. And so they want to um, um, have a have a kind of presence in the Arctic. And they have been, they, they do fund um, research stations, uh, one of them in um, Svalbard, which is north of Norway. And what they're doing is basically they're sending a giant icebreaker and they're going to send it right the way around the Arctic Ocean. So it's going to go um, the northeast passage to Iceland. So it's going to come over the top of Russia, um, docking Iceland, and then go through the northwest passage on the way back. Hmm. Now, last year it could have done that um, without needing an icebreaker. <laughs> um, this year, will they need to actually break any ice? Uh, that's a, an interesting question. And again, that's something that we're going to monitor very closely over the um, the next few months as we see how the Arctic ice, sea ice melts this summer. Um, so it's a, it's a sort of geopolitical thing. Here are the Chinese um, kind of staking their interest in the future of the Arctic as the ice disappears. It sounds to me though like the Arctic in the summer is becoming a casual destination. Yeah, well, you know, there could well be um, more tourism up there, certainly. I mean, I know that um, in Greenland in particular, they'd be very interested in get, getting lots of tourists, you know. Mm. Um, let's go and see it all before it disappears. Mm. Unfortunately, getting there might well contribute to the disappearance. So. Oh, that's right. Well, that's, um, I think that's our load of news uh, for this episode. Um, very shortly, we're going to get our guest on, um, Olaf uh, Morgenstern, who is a um, climate, um, he's a climate modeller.
and chemistry uh, climate modeler at NIWA. We're going to be talking about ozone, but I do want to um, give a big thumbs up to our um, supporters, our media partners over at Celsius. C-E-L-S-I-A-S dot co dot NZ. Great website with a whole bunch of news about um, uh, how businesses get involved in their communities around New Zealand and also lots of um, sustainability issues and green tech over there as well. They like to um, post our show, which we're very thankful for. And also scoop dot co dot NZ, um, which is a, a premier New Zealand news website. Um, a great site that kind of give, often gives a, a, a different point of view, an alternative point of view to some of the mainstream websites. And uh, also, while you're there, I recommend checking out something else that I do over at Scoop with um, Sal and Manning over there. We do something called <laughs> um, Eye on the World, um, which we're very excited about, actually. It's a, a quick sort of 10-minute roundup, weekly roundup, of the latest news, particularly focusing on what's happening over in North Africa and the Middle East and places like Afghanistan as well, with a real roundup of of uh, news sources from around the world and, and getting it in a, in a sort of a bite size, but also perhaps from a point of view that you also won't find in other mainstream media. So look out for that over at scoop.co.nz. Glenn, Glenn yeah. one question. Given given the fate of the climate show, how on earth do you manage to keep that down to ten minutes? <laughs> I know, I know. It sounds very good at um at preparing everything, editing everything down. Um and but yeah, no, yeah, it's a it's a hard <laughs> it's a hard deal. I'm I'm very undisciplined at the best of times as well. But anyway, thanks very much to um to those two media partners. Now it's time to get our special guest on, and today we're featuring. Ozone, the ozone layer. It's been, I think, uh, been a while since the ozone has even featured really much in the um, in the mainstream news. I think we've been neglecting the ozone layer somewhat. And a, a story popped up just a couple of weeks ago from the World Meteorological Organization. They did a report on ozone depletion, and they're saying that um, over the Arctic, the ozone uh, is depleting. Um, at a far greater rate than ever before, which um, kind of grabs headlines, I suppose. Um, but there's a little bit of debate about this. So I thought we could discuss that and a, whole, and a few other things and also get back to ozone basics. So we have a chemistry climate modeler at NIWA in New Zealand. His name is Dr. Olaf Morgenstern, and he, and he joins us uh, in Otago. Hello to you, Olaf. Uh, hello. Hi, Olaf. Yes. It's Gareth here. Um, you're based in Lauder in central Otago, aren't you? And, and you've just had a 50th birthday, I understand. Uh, that's correct. So Lauder, the, the, the Lauder research station was uh, established in 1961 um, and uh, especially in the last two to three decades played an important role in, um, well, the question of the ozone hole, the um, you know, chemical and dynamical explanation the science behind the ozone hole. I mean, so Lauder is quite an important um, place on the map for people in our field. Hmm. I, I wonder How many of you are there down there, Olaf? Um, we are, at the moment, we are seven scientists and uh, maybe five or six or so technicians, so that order of magnitude. Hmm. Okay. Okay. I, I wonder, before we get into um, the sort of the nitty-gritty of um, some of the current news around ozone, could we just quickly get back to basics and very briefly... Um, just explain what the ozone layer is and what it actually does um, and just a few of the, 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 the methods around actually measuring it um, and then we'll get into the hole as well. Yes. Uh, so ozone is um, a compound of oxygen composed of three um, uh, oxygen atoms as opposed to regular oxygen, which is two oxygen atoms. And it's formed uh, in the stratosphere. Ozone is formed by uh, basically breaking up oxygen molecules and then they recombine, uh, you know, with in this ozone form. And so the ozone layer is is a region in the atmosphere uh, between about 16 kilometers to 30, 40 kilometers of altitude, in which ozone is very large and uh, it's it uh, it is formed by absorbing UV and thus prevents the uh, surface from uh, receiving large quantities of UV. Okay, which would yeah. And I, I think the, for the the ozone first came into people's consciousness uh, consciousness when um, they were told that there was this hole up there, and that was a couple of decades ago. Now, um, so <coughs> yes. how do, how do scientists even know what's going on up there? Well, we have been measuring. I mean, ozone has been in. Maybe not in the general public's mind, but in certain, clearly in, in you know in, in the scientific focus for for many decades, the ozone layer was discovered in 1913 actually, and since then we have sort of gone through steps of discovering more about the chemistry around it. Um, and so, in, back in the 70s, uh, the first satellites were launched 
Um, one of them is called TOMS, the Total Ozone Mapping Spectrometer. Uh, so satellites were launched that measure the total uh, thickness, if you like, of the ozone layer. And so we have known from this and also from ground-based measurements, uh, you know, the, the, how much ozone is there and also how it's evolving over time. Hmm. And, and is an ozone hole an actual hole in the sky? Well, it is It is a region where the thickness of the ozone layer is, you know, around a third of the average of so, the thickness of the ozone layer. So it's, so it's, a, it's a, an area where it's depleted. So it's not, it's not saying that there's no ozone there at all. No, no, there, there is there is there is measurable amounts of ozone there, but it's um, you know the average thickness the thickness of the ozone layer is measured in Dobson units, and the average thickness uh, average over the globe is around 300 Dobson units. Uh, and in the ozone layer, uh, in the ozone hole, by definition, it's less than 220. Mm. Uh, typically, I mean, it goes down to as le- as little as 100 or so. Okay. So what um, what, what initially damaged the layers of um, or the the layer of ozone, and and what what was depleting it? Well, the, 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 the main driving agent were the uh, chlorofluorocarbons. So these are organic chlorine compounds that were used industrially for various purposes, producing foam, uh, you know, refrigeration, cooling, um, uh, even in agriculture, quite a few uses. Uh, and so the, the chlorine and bromine compounds, they were released liberally into the air. They were, they're inert. They don't do much. They're not toxic. So they were quite popular, uh, and but they were very stable in the troposphere. They only decay in the stratosphere, where they release chlorine and bromine. Mm-hmm. And so this chlorine and bromine is then involved in um, in ozone depletion uh, everywhere on the on the planet, but particularly so um, in the Antarctic, where uh, you know the chlorine is chemically activated from stable compounds that. Uh, basically prevail in most other places, uh, but in the in the Antarctic we have what's known as polar stratospheric clouds. So these are clouds that form in the very low temperatures there, and on the surfaces of these little ice crystals or solid crystals, um, the chlorine is 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 transferred from uh, chemically stable forms to reactive forms that then deplete ozone. That's the reason why the ozone depletion maximizes over Antarctica when you know by contrast the emissions are predominant in the northern hemisphere. Actually, okay. No. Now this this um, process actually depends on it being very cold, doesn't it? So the colder it is up there, the greater the rate of ozone depletion. Is that right? Uh, that's correct. So the um, well, it depends where you are. If if you have um, if if you're in mid latitudes or in the tropics, then lower temperatures actually mean more ozone. That's because okay. the chemical reactions that deplete ozone slow down as you lower the temperature. But in Antarctica, as I said, you, you the temperatures are so low that you get these uh, heterogeneous surfaces forming, the polar stratospheric clouds, and then you get into an altogether different chemical regime. Then you get into this regime where chlorine is activated, as I said, from inorganic, from um, disactivated to active forms, which then deplete ozone. So you get, you, you know, therefore, um, well, that's the reason why there's only an ozone hole of Antarctica, not elsewhere. Mm. We also had negative trends in the thickness of the ozone layer, uh, you know, over New Zealand, for example, but they were much smaller than over Antarctica. Mm. Mm. Now, I was under the impression, though, that um, that we'd sorted out the release of these ozone-depleting chemicals into the air. So why <coughs> are we still getting a news story that says that there is ozone depletion in the Arctic? Well, we have greatly reduced the emissions of these compounds, that's correct. That's the success of the Montreal Protocol and its amendments. The Montreal Protocol was signed in 1987, and in about 2000 or so, the uh, chlorine loading of the stratosphere peaked, and since then has been declining. So in that sense, you're right, we have basically, we're beginning to sort out this issue. But the lifetime of these species is measured in decades, um, so anywhere between 50 and 100 years or so. Uh, so in other words, uh, the removal of chlorine from the stratosphere is a slow process. Huh. At the same time, um, so that means, you know, the, the, the year of maximum ozone depletion in the Antarctic is only uh, six years ago, I think, or four years ago. So quite recently, we've seen very big ozone depletion in the, in the Antarctic as well. And in the Arctic, the story is a little different in the Arctic. The temperatures are a little higher than over Antarctica. <clears throat> that means you you have very large variability year on year on the occurrence of these polar stratospheric clouds. 
Um, also, um, due to general climate change, there is a cooling trend in the stratosphere. And so if you're close to this threshold of um, polar stratospheric cloud formation, as we typically are in the Antarctic, uh, in the Arctic, then this trend means that, uh, you know, for some time, the cooling trend and the reducing trend in the halogens will, uh, in a sense, compete. And so it's not, it is possible, therefore, that you see large ozone depletion in the Arctic in a few years to come and even in this year of course as we've seen okay so the, so, the... so what we've got happening is that the greenhouse gases in the troposphere are uh, keeping heat closer to the surface of the earth so the stratosphere itself is cooling and this is making right. it um it's tending to prolong the effect of the ozone scavenging processes that are happening in the stratosphere huh. That's correct. Yes. So, uh, so we have recently, um, that is, uh, you know, a, a group of my colleagues internationally and ourselves, we participated in a large model intercomparison exercise where we predicted uh, what the recovery of the ozone layer will look like, and it turns out that it recovers. We'll recover more quickly from the more limited ozone depletion uh, in mid latitudes than we will over Antarctica, because, um, as I said, this cooling trend will sort of. Um, cancel out some of the effect of the reducing reduction in chlorine meaning that uh, you know we'll we'll so the the ozone hole will therefore survive you know about two decades uh, it will take two decades longer for the ozone hole to disappear than for the uh, anthropogenic ozone depletion of New Zealand for example to to disappear that's the prediction roughly so two decades we're away we're looking for um a a, a healthy ozone layer and, 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 and uh, no no what i meant to say is the um recovery over antarctica is slower than over new zealand and so the difference in terms of recovery to 1980s values for example is is about two decades but the total recovery time is uh, for Antarctica, about 2060 or so, we would expect to return to, you know, 1980 values or so. Okay, so just, can we can we go back to that, the original story um, released by the World Meteorological um, uh, Organization that's, um, that, that said that the uh, ozone over the Arctic was depleting at a, um, at a faster rate now than ever before? And, I mean, has that been reported accurately? I mean, is that the story? Um. Well, the Antarctic ozone depletion has reached record levels. Yes, that is that is that is correct. I mean, that's what has been observed. Um, I Does would... that mean that um, people in Britain and North America and Canada and so on need to be watching? Um, you know, in in the spring in New Zealand, we get warnings about you know extreme UV danger and so on. Is that yes. something that uh, Europeans and North Americans need to think about this year? Um, Possibly. I mean, the ozone layer is naturally thicker in the northern hemisphere than it is here, huh. which means the sort of base UV is lower um, in, in, in Europe than it is, uh, you know, at the same latitude here in New Zealand. Uh, you know, the danger is from excursions of, uh, you know, former high latitude air, which is ozone depleted into mid latitudes. So you can you then get these episodes lasting you know from a few hours to a day or so with very low uh, ozone overhead. Um, yeah, I mean you know the weather services issue routine warnings about you know keep yourself covered and so on. They do that irrespective of ozone depletion. But I suspect there's more reason this spring to be vigilant then. Yeah. Okay, Gareth, I know that you've got some questions about the ozone hole and how that affects the entire circulation of the Southern Hemisphere all the way to the equator. Yeah, well, I wanted just to explore one of the differences between um, Antarctica and the Arctic is that over the Antarctic, because you have, you know, there's what they call a polar vortex, which is very yes. intense in Antarctica, isn't it? It tends to trap the ozone hole over Antarctica, and you get this um, very cold temperatures in the stratosphere there. And you don't you don't get the same thing to the same extent in the Arctic. Am I am I uh, correct? Is, uh, well, you're correct in that the uh, polar vortex over Antarctica tends to be colder and more long lived than over the Arctic. Yes, but there is also a polar vortex in in the Arctic. Uh, it is typically a little more perturbed in that you find it, you know, there are wave structures and excursions of ozone depleted air into mid-latitudes occurring all winter in the north. 
Um, uh, often you get also major stratospheric warmings, which is when the polar vortex breaks into two. That is a reasonably regular feature in the north and only ever historically occurred once in this house. Oh, that's it's interesting. interesting. Yes. Yeah. So, so how, how, do, how is it that this structure over Antarctica can have or can be seen to have an impact on weather patterns um, further north? Yes, uh, so the, the polar vortex, um, well, uh, I mean, uh, as a background, you need to know that the circulation in the stratosphere, uh, sorry, in the troposphere, so in the lower atmosphere where we live, is sort of divided into three regimes. So the Hadley cell, ferret cell, and uh, polar cell, I believe. So basically three regimes. And so they, they, they are, you know, on the pole, on the equator what side, you get upward motion in the tropics and then at the sort of uh, you know and then downward flow in the in the subtropics and uh, rising motion again in the mid latitudes and downward flow in in uh, you know in in over the pole it's like and three so, it's like three donut rings around the planet that's, isn't it that's roughly correct i mean they're highly perturbed and uh, you know in, in terms of shape but yes that's basically the general view it's bit similar to you know if you put a pot of water onto a hob and heat it uh, more in the center than in in the uh, on the perimeter, then you'll find that convective cells develop, and on a larger scale, that occurs on the planet as well. Yeah. Um, and uh, and but the the boundaries of these cells or the sizes of these cells have changed due to it, so the the central the, the polar cell basically has um, shrunk due to the occurrence of the ozone hole, and so that means that the other the boundaries of the other uh, cells also move poleward and. Um, that's because of the perturbation to the radiation balance, essentially associated with the ozone depletion. Okay, so uh, the the consequence around Antarctica. I know that one of the kind yeah. of robust things that people have modelled and observed is that the westerly winds get get faster. That's correct. So, um, so the basically the this polar cell has contracted and the winds uh, have gone up. Yes, that's the strengthening, as we say, of the southern angular mode. Uh, so the southern angular mode is a kind of donut shaped again uh, you know oscillation mode of the atmosphere um, and uh, due to ozone depletion this uh, at least seasonally in summer in particular has grown stronger yes and so that affects uh, basically the climate throughout the uh, southern extra tropics including New Zealand okay so the paper that I wanted to um, ask you about was in Science, at the April 21st issue, and yes. a group of researchers had um, report findings that the ozone hole had infected the entire circulation all the way to the equator, and in particular, rainfall patterns in Australia. Do you think that's a, a reasonable thing? Um, I mean, that's a model finding. I'd say it is plausible. Um, but it is just a model finding. I mean, we have we have actually speculated for some time that maybe the anomalous rainfall, you know, the the large drought in southern Australia, which occurred until recently, that that might be linked to the occurrence of the ozone hole. Um, I'd say it's plausible, um, but more sort of validating studies, more model studies need to be done. I mean, the problem with modeling is, and this is a modeling study that you're talking about, the problem with models is that if you have one model, uh, you know, you get some result, but you don't know how significant it is because models tend to differ from each other, even if they're equivalent in the way they're formulated. Yeah. So, uh, so if you want to sort of... Um, make this a more robust finding, typically what people do is have more than one model, you know, a group of models. And if these groups, the group of models uh, tends to agree on one particular feature, then we believe that. Um, I mean, in climate modeling, this is an aspect of climate modeling, a difficulty that we have is that we have, that we really cannot generally say much about regional climate change in, the, in these large-scale models because, um, you know, um, we are a lot more confident about the sort of global effects of global warming or climate change in general. But when it comes to regional effects, um, for reasons that few people fully understand, uh, the uh, regional predictions tend to be a lot more unreliable than the global sort of outlook. Mm. Yeah. Uh, and, and so, you know, Australian rainfall patterns are in that category. This is a regional phenomenon. It is. It would tie in with the idea that um, you know the boundaries of these um, circulation systems in the, in the troposphere have shifted, and that's also what has what has been observed. But if you want to attribute this, um, 
you can say that yes, this model suggests that ozone depletion is involved in this, but to firm this up, you really want uh, more studies done in this field. Hmm. And yeah. in fact, we ourselves are in this area. I'm myself planning to conduct some experiment on this. Okay. Um, is there any sort of similar effect observable in the Northern Hemisphere? Uh, you, possibly. Uh, I mean, you've got two problems there. One is that the ozone depletion in the Northern Hemisphere is much smaller than in the South because they don't have you know, an ozone hole. They don't usually have winters like this one when there's a lot of ozone depletion in the Arctic. Mm. Uh, also, in mid-latitudes, the uh, anthropogenic ozone loss was smaller than, uh, than here in, in New Zealand. Uh, and the second problem is that weather patterns are more variable in the north than in the south. That means, so, you know, basically, uh, um, you know, the strengths of the polar vortex, the, the um, as expressed in the wind velocity around its perimeter, for example, is that's more variable than in the south. And so that means if you if you if you're after establishing trends or if you're after establishing causal links, then you have to cope with a larger degree of variability in the system that means you need a longer time series or a larger signal one of the two to basically nail down uh, you know any findings yes it, so, sounds it sounds horrendously complex because you're dealing with one factor which is being impacted by many many others uh, indeed i mean that's the nature of atmospheric science i mean the, the atmosphere is a highly coupled system so we're talking basically two developments that coincide one is one is ozone depletion in the, in the Arctic or in the Antarctic. The other is climate change. Mm. Um, and so, you know, for example, as we're looking at climate impacts of ozone recovery, and that's a topic that some of us are interested in. Um, so, I mean, if, if everything else remained the same, we would expect, uh, you know, climate trends that we have observed in the past 30 years to reverse as the ozone recovers. Um, but of course, you know, not everything will remain the same. Climate change occurs at the same time, so we need to separate these two factors. And but they're not clearly separable because, uh, you know, climate change has got an impact on on the ozone layer. So, um, you know, that's so, the complication that we have to couple with. Yes, absolutely. So, in in a sense, the ozone layer may have hastened some of the impacts in the southern hemisphere. The the changes that climate change might it be expected to bring but at the same time the recovery of the ozone hole will itself tend to delay those impacts more well it depends which region you're looking at i mean in the antarctic peninsula for example this is the region uh, in antarctica that's just to the south of south america and and the furthest north you know the the, yeah, the yeah. bit that's protruding quite far north that has experienced record rates of warming associated with you know glacial loss and so on, loss of ice shelves. Uh, however, the, the the central part of or the um, eastern Australian, uh, sorry, eastern Antarctic ice shelf, that region has probably cooled during that same period of time. Uh, you know, it's basically this, the, an aspect of the circulation change that I talked about before, the southern annular mode strengthening. So now if ozone depletion is going to be reversed, then we might expect the southern annular mode to weaken. Um, and Antarctica then too warm. But maybe, uh, you know, the Antarctic Peninsula might warm a little less or might even cool again. You know, we, we don't fully know, but um, it depends on the balance, uh, you know, how much of this warming over the Antarctic Peninsula was caused by global warming generally, so ma mainly carbon dioxide increasing, and how much was caused by ozone depletion. So, so different regions will be affected differently by this development. Yeah, yeah. Uh, it's fascinating stuff because um, obviously the greenhouse gas forcing um, isn't going away and is in fact increasing year to year. So the balance between that and the recovery of the ozone layer is, is, is clearly um, going to be very difficult to sort out. Mm. Indeed, yes. Um, yeah, I mean, we... we, we I mean, what one one aspect of this is that uh, you know, as I said, uh, Eastern Antarctic, um, Eastern Antarctica has probably cooled now. Then it's probably set for rapid warming. That's the fear that some of us have. Yeah. And it, of course, um, you know, is uh, most of the um, ice masses uh, on the on the Earth side in that region. And so, if it gets substantially warmer there, then you know that will have implications on 
uh, sea level rise, uh, you know, circulation in the Southern Ocean and associated features. So um, yeah, that's a space to watch, I suppose. Mm. Yes, absolutely, absolutely. Well, it certainly um, um, has been a... A question out of the blue, Olaf. Oh, yes. Is there any... I'm just thinking about it as we're talking about it. One of the things that um, climate scientists do when they want to try and work out what what happened is they they look at the past. Yeah, are there any proxies for ozone level? Is there any way of trying to work out um, what ozone levels may have been in the past? Um. Well, that's a very tricky question. Um, I mean, ozone, so for, <laughs> Sorry for, for most, for some, uh, for some climate gases uh, like methane and CO2, ice cores can be used. But of course, ozone is, is uh, first of all, it's not stable. It wouldn't be preserved in an ice core. Um, secondly, it maximizes in the stratosphere, not at the surface. So you would measure surface. This is the composition of surface air, not in this. In, so basically what people have probably tried to do is use plants, for example, that respond to levels of UV uh, to infer how much ozone, you know, we would have had in at times in the past. But it, this is, it, to my knowledge, this is not quantitative. So really the ozone levels uh, of the past are typically model reconstructions constrained with uh, you know the past few decades for which we have satellite observations that's that's yeah. the common way of doing so it. it it's not something that you can find in ice cores or in rocks um well rocks uh, i'm not aware of any rock sort of you know caves or so i i i, I don't know about this so mm. uh, the 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 ozone climatologies that i've seen that uh, extends into the 19th century for example uh, they they do not use any observations of ozone, as far as I know. Hmm. Okay. I mean, you, of course, observations of ozone started already in the 19th century. It was it discovered in the 19th century as hmm. a gas? Uh, but then you're talking surface measurements, uh, you know, urban pollution and so on. So that's an entirely different story. Hmm. Yeah. Yeah. Well, it's been really good to um, to revisit um, ozone um, and and really, I think, clear up um, a few of the mysteries around it, and also to sort of take the temperature of. Uh, of where it's at at the moment. Absolutely right. fascinating, yes. Olaf. Many, many thanks yes. for taking the time to do this with us. Mm. Right, you're welcome. Yeah. And I, I think you'd agree, you probably have one of the best jobs in the world there in central Otago with the great scenery and the um, and the very nice Pinot Noir, which is very, very well known in there in yes. central Otago. The Pinot Noir is particularly appreciated, yes. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and the clean air, the clean air as well, it's very nice, very crisp. Yes, I mean, the, the reason why Lauder, I mean, the, the research station is that Lauder is, is particularly because of the clean air that we find around here. Yeah. And and the large, relatively large sunshine totals, I mean, that's the reason why we're located where we are. Right, well, our guest has been Dr. Olaf Morgenstern, who's a chemistry climate modeller at NIWA. Thanks so much for joining us, and I do recommend that people, um, if they want to catch up on your work, just search for you on the NIWA website. Thanks, Olaf. Right, thank you. Thank you, Olaf. That's uh, fantastic. Thank you. Right, it's normally about this time of the show that John Cork comes on in and um, debunks some sceptical arguments. However, um, he's not with us this week. Um, he's on a book promotion tour, isn't he, Gareth? Absolutely. His book, um, Climate Denial, Heads in the Sand, has uh, been launched in Australia this week. So he's been touring around um, doing the promotion for that. So I uh, hope it's going well, John. Uh, good luck with that. And we'll welcome you back to the show in a couple of weeks. Yeah, look forward to discussing the book as well and finding out what is contained within. Yeah, um, Brian Walker at Hot Topic did a review of it last week um, when it was launched in the UK. And it sounds like a fascinating read. It's definitely mm. one I'm going to have to uh, put, it, put in the pile. Absolutely. All right, well, let's get into the, the uh, many parts solutions part of the show. And there are some great ones coming up. But first off, we're talking about airships. Uh, being a possible solution to uh, long-haul travel. Yeah, and what, what it is is that um, airships, because they've got um, buoyancy, can carry heavier loads um, without having to use so much fuel. So if you want to carry a heavy load in a traditional plane, you have to um, push that plane through the air, have big wings, carry the weight. With an airship, a lot of the weight carrying is actually being done by the buoyancy of the gas, and modern airships tend to use um, helium. Um, 
in the old days of the Zeppelins, you know, the um, not the legs of Zeppelin, but the Zeppelins of the First World War, right through the 1920s and into the 30s, they used hydrogen gas, which was, of course, why they went down in flames. Um, these modern ones tend to use helium, which is inert and, and much safer. Mm. So there have been a number of companies working on um, these sorts of airships. Um, the idea basically is that you can uh, carry an enormous payload without needing a huge runway or lots of tarmac. And they could do so, um, carry those loads at a fraction of the fuel um, cost of a traditional air, 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 um, aircraft. What puzzles me so, about it, though, is that is that um, I would imagine that they would be, wouldn't be easily controllable. You know, a good um, gust of wind and they'll blow off course. Yeah, absolutely. It's um, it's a bit more like um, having a sailing ship, I suppose. You've you, you've got to you 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 have to sort of um, go with the wind or work with the wind, um, and battling against it might um, might be a problem. But so, can you can you look? Can you imagine it? I I haven't got my um, book from Amazon on time because the um the 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 jet streams just weren't favourable that week. I don't know. I just in our modern society, I don't see that <laughs> that being uh you know this this whole everything's got to be on time and um, all this customer um, expectation. I just don't see it. Well, I mean, it's not. I can't say this about airships because I don't think we ever had um, intercontinental. Well, we did actually have airships that crossed from Europe to the States um, before the Second World War. Um, that was the Graf Zeppelin. That was the one that famously went down in flames in the yeah. US. But um, yeah, if you go back to the days of sailing ships, sailing ships were actually getting from New Zealand to Europe in about the same time as modern container ships. Oh. I mean, they they, they were. Um, uh, really fast those clippers that that were used. So there's no reason why. Uh, yeah, okay, you're not going to be putting really time sensitive stuff onto um, an airship, mm. but you know heavy heavier stuff that um, that that doesn't need the, um, the, the to be there you know tomorrow uh, could could be carried. And one of the areas that they're looking at um, using these things in is places like northern Canada. Um, they estimate that to put in a kilometre of all-weather road in the sort of frozen north of Canada can cost as much as a, a million dollars a kilometre. Um, so an airship that can carry the same sort of load as a, you know, a, a, a lorry and trailer um, doesn't need a road, can just go up there, hmm. drop the stuff down and then fly back and pick up something else. That sort of thing probably has a great future. So what it is is... a an interesting um, development that people have been working on over the last 10 or 15 years and which will you know, hopefully help us to move towards uh, a period where we're getting uh, relatively low carbon air cargo. Um, so the the picture of the airship that we're looking at on the um, the video feed is from Lockheed Martin. It does look, I mean, it looks, looks quite impressive. It looks far more modern than what you'd expect an airship to um, to look like, and so they have actually built one of these things. So they they're well underway, aren't they? Oh yeah, and there have been there are Lockheed Martin. There have been other people doing it as well, and of course they've got modern materials. They can um, make them almost any shape. There are other companies that um, make them a bit more aerodynamic than, than that, so that they actually generate some lift as they're going forward. So they're high tech things that, um, that 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 are you know much more kind of useful than than mm. you know what might have been a second world war blimp or you know balloon or anything like that the, these are real airships that um, offer some really interesting possibilities mm. okay moving on um now uh, google have decided to invest 168 million dollars in the world's largest solar power tower plant and i can understand why because aren't they massive uses of um, energy with all their server farms that they have to, to serve all the Google services that they have? Yeah, absolutely. Well, you see, Google has actually invested in the company that's producing this um, this uh, facility in the Mojave Desert in, in California. And they're going, they've spent $168 million um, to create what will be the world's largest solar power tower, power tower plant. Huh. Um, basically, it's a field full of mirrors, and the mirrors will, which are technically, we call them heliostats, um, these will focus the sun 
uh, on to, onto the top of a tower where there'll be basically a high temperature furnace. And the temperatures can get up to 550 Celsius. So that's, you know, pretty hot. Mm. And that will, that will drive a standard turbine and generator. And they recycle the water. So the energy, um, it, it's effectively free because it's coming from the sun. But they're going to generate off this um, $168 million plant, which is on 3,600 acres. It'll be 370 megawatts of power. Um, which is enough to serve 140,000 homes in California during peak hours. Mm. It's in Ivanpah, which I'm probably not pronouncing terribly well, but which is 50 miles northwest of Needles in California, very close to the Nevada border, so in the desert. I wonder if they will generate enough, uh, for not only for their own needs, but then to feed back into the grid. Oh, I'm sure. Yeah, absolutely. This will be a grid grid link com- grid linked um, generating station. Mm. Um, it'll be the biggest. There is already one operating in Spain. You may have seen pictures of it under, the, which have the the, the rays of the sun focusing in on this tower. So mm. the actual um, principle is established and and will work. Uh, the the company that Google has invested in claims to have got better technology than most, and Google obviously agree because they they put some seed money into the company. Um, as part of their investments in renewable energy technologies that they started a few years ago. Uh, um, and now they've stepped it up to the next level to to actually build a, a full-scale um, plant. And, of course, the sort of desert areas of um, are a prime country for this. If yeah. you can find areas which, you know, when there's obviously, like, like a bit like building a wind farm, really, you want to be a bit careful about where you put them. You're not going to put them in the middle of a really st- stupendous landscape. No, this but, is right. Um, but they, they, they have the possibility to generate this uh, the basically free fuel source, which is the sun. Hmm. There's a lot of it about. Staying with um, solar, um, fo- photovoltaic uh, photovoltaic uh, cells could one day transform skyscrapers into giant solar collectors. Yeah, that, this is one I really liked um, because it's, you know, you look up at, I was in Wellington at the weekend and that, the, the Wellington, Wellington city centre is all basically tower blocks, tall buildings, multi-storeys, covered in glass. And what the, this team um, at MIT have been able to do is to create a transparent photovoltaic cell. And the idea is that, that, that these cells, they're based on organic molecules, very similar to dyes and pigments. Um, and they absorb only the near infrared spectrum. And so the rest of the light that, you, that we see um, can come through into the rooms. Um, but the that near infrared spectrum is is um, trans is, is changed into electricity, or um, is fired up into electricity. So, at the moment, the, the cells aren't particularly efficient. They're only about two percent, but they think they can get it up to more like ten percent with um, with a bit of work. So, what you're looking at is the possibility that um, I mean, people already put all sorts of different coatings on glass to you know reflect or to um, keep it clean and so on. Yeah. So why not put a, a photovoltaic layer into your glass when you're cladding a, a, a large building? Yeah. And on the sun-facing sides, you put this stuff and you get a large chunk of energy coming back into the building that you can use for lighting um, and and all sorts of things. So it's, it's a very interesting development. And if it can be done cheaply enough mm. um, and long-lasting enough, because glass... It's very long-lived as a product, you know. I don't know about my house here is is um, about 110 years old, and there's certainly original panes of glass here. So you're going to have to build something um, that will that will that will last a good long time. Mm. Take note. Yeah, I it- take note. I was going to say, take note. The uh, the people rebuilding Christchurch. These are the type of technologies that um, we should be thinking about, particularly when rebuilding a, a whole city like this. Yeah, I think it would be marvellous if we were able to um, use these sorts of technologies as we as we do rebuild the city in the future. And I know there are a lot of people who are thinking along the lines of, of making sure that we build a, a sustainable and low energy and low carbon city. So I hope that, that those sorts of ideas can, can, can work forward, yeah. Yeah, well, it wouldn't be the mini-part solution feature of the show without a story about cars, and this time talking <laughs> about uh, making fuel cells much cheaper and that's what we need 
Yeah, well, you see, we've talked a lot on the show about um, electric vehicles, about cars that have electric motors that um, run with large batteries. Now, these batteries tend to be quite expensive and, and heavy, and so battery technology is terribly important to the future of um, electric vehicles, particularly if we want to have lots and lots and lots of them. At the same time that people have been looking at electric vehicles, and up until the last probably four or five years, prior to that, everybody thought we would move from an oil economy to a hydrogen economy. Um, the problem with you know, hydrogen is a, is, is a gas, it burns in air to make water. Mm. And the idea was that, you know, you would fill your fuel tank with hydrogen and you could then use hydrogen. Um, or you could put it into a fuel cell, which basically controls the, comb the, the combining of hydrogen and oxygen to make electricity. So you could have, um, they were talking about a hydrogen economy. And I think in Iceland, they, they went to some considerable lengths to, um, to experiment with using hydrogen because they could, uh, they could basically crack uh, the water into hydrogen and oxygen using their geothermal mm. um, energy. They have a lot of in Iceland. Um, the, use, the using the hydrogen in fuel cells, one of the biggest problems is that the fuel cells themselves depend on a catalyst, and those catalysts have been very expensive, um, typically using lots of um, platinum and stuff. So what these researchers at the Los Alamos National Laboratory have developed is a platinum-free catalyst that uses um, carbon, iron, and cobalt, which are actually, uh, they say, two to three orders of magnitude cheaper, which means that fuel cells... Uh, will come down in price. So the, the advantage that um, this offers over a battery is that basically hydrogen, although you have to keep it very cold, you know, it has to be cryogenically cooled, mm. um, it, it is still a bit more like oil than, 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 uh, than electricity. And so you can fill a car with hydrogen um, from a fuel pump and then use that hydrogen to, to drive the car um, I'm still a bit sceptical about the idea of building a full-scale hydrogen economy. Yeah. There's one very big question about where the hydrogen comes from. <clears throat> a lot of the hydrogen that people use at the moment actually comes from uh, burning fossil fuels. Yeah. And, um, they use methane to make it. So, yeah, purpose. still a bit sceptical about that. But the idea that you have fuel cells that are cheap uh, or a lot cheaper and therefore com more commercially available, it kind of adds another, another tool to the kit. And for that, for that reason alone, the idea that we've um, that these guys have come up with um, will, will help. I mean, there, there are going to be some hydrogen cars on the market in the next few years. Well, so. they're saying Toyota, Mercedes Benz, and Honda are among the automakers promising to deliver hydrogen fuel cell vehicles in 2015. Yeah, that's right. And you know, it'll be they won't be cheap, but then electric vehicles aren't cheap at the moment. Mm. But it's going to be yeah. So it, it's it's. One of those things we've, you know, all four of the stories we've done today have depended on um, new technologies that are coming to market to really um, enable us to uh, reduce our carbon emissions without having to give things up. You know, we're, we, we, can fly, we can air freight stuff if we're clever and, and can develop airships to do it, particularly in areas like northern Canada. Um, we can use solar power. We can either do it with these great big solar power stations, such as the Google project, or we can use photovoltaics and some different technologies coming mm. in photovoltaics. And then you've got things like, you know, research, clever researchers coming up with um, really quite significant improvements in technologies that have been around for a while, like, like fuel cells. Mm. Um, yeah, so I, I, we've been a bit gloomy in, in recent shows about prospects. And yeah. We started out this show talking about um, you know the prospect for a for a for a deal in Durban uh, looking um, looking less much less likely than perhaps might have thought. Right. But you know there is there is good stuff too, and the good stuff comes in the sort of technology end of the business. We 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 definitely as a species are certainly smart enough to come up with solutions to the problem, but have we got the will to do it? That's the big question. So Gareth, are you ready? <laughs> are you ready to end the show? I think we might be about to, yes, Glenn. <laughs> Actually, I do have a question, just because um, I, I tweeted out just before we started the um, <clears throat> the recording of the show. 
uh, that uh, we were recording. And so someone sent in a question, Nigel Leck on Twitter um, asks, could I add a question for the climate show? How frequent are cyclones at this time of the year in New Zealand? Well, we don't have cyclones uh, at all at this time of the year in New Zealand, do we? Um, Not in I May. We, I think on average... Um, one extra tropical cyclone because they're not tropical cyclones when they get down here. They're the kind mm. of remnants of them. Uh, on average, I think about one a year um, really? gets down to our neck of the woods. Um, some miss us. Some, it depends where they cross. depends how severe they are. Um, so you have really, um, you know, but there are historical occasions like the storm that sank the Wahine in Wellington Harbour. Yeah. Yeah. Um, you know, they, they can be major, major storms, but they can also just give people a flick. I mean, I, I'm not sure what Nigel was, was referring to, whether he's referring to the sort of weather conditions that created the Albany tornado. It wasn't a cyclone. The, no, it wasn't. It was just, you know, a set of, a set of weather that happens in New Zealand, you know, relatively frequently. It just happened to be worse than most and, and to catch a snapping or catch a few people and um, cause damage. And as, as you the, say, it is difficult to talk about cyclones in New Zealand context because we don't actually have cyclones that much. Uh, you know, they're, they're just deep depressions or tropical, ex-tropical cyclones. Yeah, that's right. But what we do get from them is lots of rain. Mm. And I haven't, I haven't actually done much digging into the floods that hit the east coast of the North Island last week. But I think I mentioned at the beginning of the show there were regions that, that got... 500 mils um, in a couple of days, mm. and this did cause huge amount of damage. Farms, there are farms that have lost 40% of their pasture to topsoil washing down. Mm. And I know we've talked in previous shows about you know heavier rainfall events um, being related to the warming of the climate, and it wouldn't surprise me at all if there wasn't an element of that in that recent heavy rainfall event. Yeah. All right, well, um, let's thank our guest, um, Olaf uh, Morgan Stern, Morgan Stern, for um, joining us uh, and uh, talking about ozone today. Um, John Cook will be back in the next episode. Um, and yes, and we've got a really good show coming up next time because, yeah. as I said, I think we, we're hoping to get Jim Hansen um, in, into a room with a laptop or two and uh, record an interview for the next show. So that'll be good. And um, have a think about what we were talking about at the, um, at the top of the show with uh, the idea of having a, some kind of um, a tip jar uh, to make this show yes. sustainable so we can add some more bells and whistles into the future as well and uh, give us yeah. some feedback used, on that. Used banknotes only, please, in brown <laughs> paper envelopes to <laughs> Glenn Williams, the <laughs> <laughs> number one. <laughs> <laughs> but in all seriousness, right. give, give us some feedback. We want some feedback on that. We, and let us know what you think, uh, either at theclimateshow.com or the hot topic, hot-topic.co.nz um, or on Facebook, uh, facebook.com forward slash theclimateshow, twitter.com forward slash theclimateshow. Yes, Gareth? Yep, so, and, and feedback too, please, on, on everything, yeah. the show contents, and just to encourage people to embed the show. If you've got a website or a blog and you like what we're doing, feel free to embed. The more viewers, the better. The more listeners, the better. Um, don't forget to go and check the podcast out through iTunes or download it from um, theclimateshow.com or from hottopic.co.nz. And uh, we look forward to catching up with you in a couple of weeks. Indeed. We'll see you then, Gareth. Cheers, Glenn. Be good. What good is it trapping the ocean?